just like this. So in the perpendicular direction, we have the normal force going up, Fn, minus the gravitational force going down. And we ask ourselves, is there any net movement in the up and down perpendicular direction right here? Is the, is the Dodge Caravan flying up or down? And you're like, no, it's not moving up or down. So your net force in the perpendicular direction is zero newtons. So that works out pretty slick, right? Now, some people might be like, well, Laurent, you said it's not equal to zero because it's constantly accelerating. It's not accelerating in the perpendicular direction. It's got an Fn minus an Fg and nothing's happening overall in that direction. Where it is accelerating is in this radial direction. We're gonna talk about that right now. In the radial direction, you have one force. It's the force of friction and that's acting as your centripetal force. A lot of people actually call this your summing your forces in the centripetal direction. Don't let that throw you for a loop. That's just another way to say radial, centripetal, along the radius, whatever you want to do. Some textbooks use some of the forces in the centripetal direction. It's any force acting along the radius. So the only force acting along the radius in this case is the force of friction, and we have nothing else to add up, so we just set that equal to m times a. They might say something like, it's moving at constant speed. And you're like, oh, constant speed. Back in the day, we could set that equal to zero because that means it has no acceleration. That's not the case anymore because as it goes around the turn, it's constantly changing directions. And remember, acceleration has a magnitude, which is the number, but it also has the direction. So if it's constantly changing directions, this centripetal acceleration, it's going in just like this, and it's constantly changing directions just like that. So the centripetal acceleration is occurring because it's constantly changing directions. If you want to call this something the force in the centripetal direction, which makes the centripetal acceleration, you can totally do that. If you want to call it the radial direction, that's totally okay. The really important thing though, this force of friction produces a centripetal acceleration because every time this car wants to fly off tangent, there is a force of friction inward, which causes an acceleration centripetal, or a centripetal acceleration inward, just like that. If you want to kind of get them speaking the same language, you want to call that R and that one C, that's, that's what I do actually. If you want to say I'm some of my forces in the centripetal direction and that, um, it does not matter. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna call it R. I'm gonna send my forces in the radial direction because then I'll be consistent with my coordinate system right there. I use the lowercase r. I use the lowercase r right there. It doesn't really matter, but you're just summing your forces in the up and down direction and then the in inward kind of direction right there. And now, this one's not super helpful. Fn minus Fg equals zero. That just tells you Fn equals Fg. And remember, fug equals mug. So that is something you we've known for a long time. <laughs> We're on a flat surface. The normal force is equal to gravity. There's no other forces acting in the up and down direction. Let's focus on this for a second. The force of friction equals MAC. We have a centripetal force, makes it MAC, a centripetal acceleration like this. But they want to get the R in there. Now you have some choices. You can say AC equals VT squared over R, or you can use R omega squared. You have a choice right there. And I'm just gonna go back to say, um, if they're asking about VT, like they want you to solve for VT, you could totally solve for V, make that substitution. You could say, okay, force friction equals M VT squared over R. Totally legitimate. You could say, boom, that's my force of friction. If they're asking about your angular velocity, then maybe you want to make the substitution for AC. You say, okay, I'll make that one. So force of friction equals M R omega squared. That's helpful as well, so you can do different things. Keep in mind, VT changes depending where your radius is at, whereas omega is constant. So that's something they kind of keep in mind. And in this question, they said they wanted you to solve for the radius. So let's just take this right here. Um, let's, let's, just, let's just say they gave you angular velocity. So let's say in the question, they gave you how many radians per second you're going. Let's solve this for the radius. So you'd say, boom, R equals the force of friction divided by mass times omega squared. And maybe if you wanted to, you're like, hey, I know from back in the day that the force of friction it's equal to mu times the normal force. So if you wanted to do that, and you'd be like, well, what's the normal force? The normal force is just mg. So let's just take that. We'd say, okay, mu times normal force, which is mg, boom, divided by m omega squared. That's kind of nice. You have an m on top, m on the bottom. So it's mu g over omega squared. So if you wanted this radius, and I'll explain what this means. I'm smearing big time lefty. And this is technically mu static. We'll talk about that in a second. Over omega squared. So picture this. If you were looking for the radius, that if you went beyond this radius, you go flying off tangent. If you're in this radius, you're safe. If you know the mu value, like how sticky the tires are to the asphalt surface, and you know gravity because you're on planet Earth or maybe you're on the moon or whatever, and you knew the angular velocity of the minivan, maybe you knew how many radians per second it was covering, you can figure out that critical radius that if you went outside of it, boom, you fly off tangent. If you're inside of it, you're safe. And let's see if it makes sense. If you have a big mu value, so it's a really sticky surface, the right side of the equation gets big, that means you can go pretty far out along 
that radius right there and you still wouldn't fly off tangent. You go here, 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 you're going around, you'd be fine going around the very outside edge right there. If you were going very fast, so you got a big omega, well, dividing this by a big number right there, that's gonna make your radius smaller. So if you are going to have a big omega as you go around here, you have to stay really close to the inside part of the circle to actually stay on the racetrack right there. If you got if you had a big omega and you're right on the edge right here, you're gonna go flying off tangent. So if you want to kind of picture like that's the critical radius that if you have your givens and you plug them in right there, like, okay, say it's three meters. Well, if it's inside three meters, boom, I stay on outside three meters, I go flying off tangent. You could calculate that based on that critical point. One thing to note, your radius right there does not depend on the mass of the object you're talking about because our M's went bye-bye. You could play the same game with this one, but let's stop our video right here just for now just because it's getting kind of long. So the big steps, draw a picture, label your forces, pick your coordinate system. Our coordinate system in this case, we have the radial direction, which is defined as inward as positive and the perpendicular direction, which is up and down. And we drew a top view and a side view because that was helpful. And then step four, we just summed our forces in the perpendicular direction and the radial direction. The perpendicular direction, if you want to kind of reference it back to the y direction, like back in the old days, it kind of relates very much to, you can kind of treat it the same way and you won't get it wrong if you want to picture it that way. The radial direction, however, you have to identify what force is acting toward the inside part of the circle. And if it's going inward, we call it the positive force. And then if that force is going outward, and that'd be a negative force. We'll talk about that in our next example. And you're like, oh, there's only one force, friction acting along the radial direction. We set it equal to MAC because net forces produce net accelerations. And they say, oh, what if it's moving at constant velocity, angular velocity, or linear velocity? It, it can still have a centripetal acceleration because it's changing directions as it goes on there. It flies out, it wants to go there, but it gets redirected there, there, there. It's a pretty safe bet to always set your radial force is equal to MAC. So we had that, we went through some algebra, we figured out the radius of safety, that if you're inside this number, whatever, we didn't give you any numbers, but if you punch it through and you say you had three meters, inside that you're gonna be safe. If you're outside of that, you're gonna go flying off tangent. And it's all based on your coefficient of friction, static, because you wanna know before you start to slide, right? And then gravity, and then omega in this case. And um, they could give you a velocity VT, and you could do the same question. I just decided to give you omega and work it through that way. So thanks for watching, I hope that helps. If you have any questions, it, it is confusing at first, but once you do a few, you'll get the hang of it.